Bay Gordon Head, I'd like to acknowledge your next MLA, Jessica Vanderbilt. Also, from my very strong little environmental heart, little environmental heart, little environmental heart, how much it has meant to me to see that Tom, as the first Canadian politician to make the triple bottom line and the polluter pay principle be the basis of our economic policy. I feel that, you know, Victorians really combine those values, those social values, environmental values, and the economic ones as well. For the grizzly part, we in British Columbia know something about grizzlies. And what do grizzlies do? They look after their children and they protect their territory. <laughs> little children. Every time I do this traveling, which people like Randall Garrison and Denise Savoy do all the time, I'm always in awe of how they can go whipsaw back and forth across the time zone. So we just arrived straight in from Montreal. We've already done a lot of media and had several meetings. I, I, I will start off uh, by saying the same thing as Michael because I find it's it's so appropriate that to acknowledge that we're gathered this evening on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish people it's a habit here in BC that merits being reproduced across the country. So I wanted to start off with that because I find it crucial to, to finding solutions. <laughs> Sometimes contexts are provided to you. Today we were in uh, Denise's office meeting with a lot of community leaders. It was a round table discussion with people who had been involved in environmental issues, who had been involved in housing issues, who had been involved in the Chamber of Commerce. It was an exciting meeting, it was good people. And of course, the summer in politics is a bit of the silly season, and you're never too sure what's gonna come out of it. And we just spent a good 45 minutes talking about urban transit and housing and all the issues that are so important, but, and infrastructure, the things that cities aren't able to do in Canada anymore because there's no tax base, no tax base. They've got 40% of the infrastructure and 8% of the money. They're just, they're just not making it. I'm going to call him back and tell him what we've been doing here today in Victoria, that we've been working for vision across Canada to make all of our cities sustainable, to take care of the issues that are important to people. So that produced a great result. We phoned the guy and I said, well, I'm here in the room. And then everybody started to applause when I said, I'm here to fight for all Canadian cities. And you know what? That's the theme for us, fighting for all Canadians and all of these cities. But there is a good, fundamental Canadian nature that brings us to want to take care of each other. And the institutions we've built up over the history of our country are a reflection of that. Why is the Wheat Board important? The Wheat Board's important because it's allowed Canadian prairie farmers to get an even break in the ups and downs of the market, the ups and downs of the weather, there will be bad crop seasons. You, 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 you come up with an idea that actually works. We have the same thing with regard to supply management in Canada. Our dairy farmers, our poultry farmers, our egg farmers, they can actually make a living because they're not constantly prey to one bad year, the ups and downs in the market, where large international corporations come in, scoop everything up, and leave with it. So retain this. Three-eyed fish are okay as long as you don't kill them. Because that's what we're doing in some of those ecosystems right now. We're, al we're allowing the air, the soil, and the water to be used as an unlimited free dumping ground. And that's a scandal for future generations. We will do this. We're not even being talked to anymore. I don't know if you remember this part of the debate in the spring around the budget, when I simply asked the question in the house of Mr. Harper, I said, what's your plan? You know, there's, there's a possibility of a serious debt crisis in Europe that could bring us over the brink. What's your plan? The next day I was being attacked by some of his uh, robots in the house saying he wants to give billions of dollars of Canadian monies for the, what was it, for the sumptuous lifestyle in Europe. It didn't even make any sense as an attack, but it doesn't stop them from doing it. And what we were doing and what we continue to do is say, but the Canada that we've all come to know and was respected on the world stage would have been at the table. 
they would just prefer to snap their suspenders and say, we're doing better than you are. Well, that might be true in some cases and others less so, because what we're doing right now is we're hollowing out the capacity of our government to provide the services to the public that it was always there for. You know, when you, when you look at the whole pyramid, yeah, when you look at the whole pyramid of public administration, it exists to do ultimately one thing, right? It exists to provide a direct service to the public. So that's the last thing you touch. If there are tough budget choices to be made, you preserve the direct service to the public trust. We're going to stand up to Stephen Harper. We're not going to be afraid of debates on the substance of the issues. They've given themselves a boost in branding. A lot of the media give that to them on the economy. Watch us go on the, on the economy and what the Conservatives are actually doing. They're hollowing out the ability of the government to provide those services, and then they point to the fact that there's no money left because they lower taxes mostly for the richest corporations and they say so now we have to cut those services that's their recipe it's a self-fulfilling prophecy it's a situation they've created it's the attack of the right wing across the globe we've got a vision where governments take care of people the number one reason we're there is to protect the public to help people who are in need to even out the inequalities in our society we want trade but we want it to be fair trade we do want development. Let's always make sure people understand that, but we do want it to be sustainable development, and we want prosperity, but we want prosperity for everyone. And that's what distinguishes us from the Conservatives, and that's what we're going to accomplish together. Thank you. Courts cost money. Police forces cost money. Enforcing legislation, this is all something that costs all of society something, and yet those corporations that benefit from all of that want to abscond, keep their money offshore, not pay their share of the freight. That's not fair. And we're going to fight hard to make sure that that's what we're saying. I'd like to hear from you, uh, Thomas Mulcair, that you are going to vigorously, you're going to be a grizzly, <laughs> and a mean grizzly, and uh, defend the, <coughs> the Canadian sovereignty and the Canadian territory, as both Quebec and uh, BC are under attack at the moment for water and for electric power, and I'd like to that grizzly spirit to keep it Canadian, sir. Well, yeah, I, nobody, nobody could be a better advisor on Canadian sovereignty, especially in the Arctic, than Michael Myers. I'm not sure I understand the reference to water and electric power. I can say uh, that it is in my view, and depends on, of course, your respect for these ecosystems and proper environmental assessments. And it depends a lot on, on what else is available. But overall, I think that one of the things that we should all be fighting for in Canada is a system, pan-Canadian system, a network of green renewable energy. And uh, in the future, printing will be the technology to produce electronics. So I'm, I'm very sure about this. The speakers use special inks that conduct electricity and vibrate when an electric current passes through. Layer upon layer is carefully laid down and the process can be used on plastic as well as paper, costing only pennies a page. The printing process doesn't just allow you to produce speakers such as this one, you can also print off electricity generating solar cells by the kilometer, costing only pennies a page. You can also print off electricity generating solar cells by the kilometer. We've got a lot of the technology already. We have some of the most consistent wind currents in the world, for example. Quebec has 3,000 megs, that's 3,000 times a million watts of wind right now, put in phase with existing hydropower because there's no power in, in a wind turbine. There's the ability to, to, take, to produce energy by taking the power from the wind, but it's less constant. Those two are now being able to be put in phase, produce very constant green renewable power. Um, yesterday we saw what happened in Calgary during a, you know, a, a very uh, bad weather situation where it got very hot and uh, the, the system came very close to completely breaking down. So I think that it's something that we owe to ourselves. We are capable of using all our experience and expertise and putting something very positive on the, on the agenda for the next federal election, which is having that national vision. But I think that one of the solutions, especially with the second part, with regard to mines, is to make sure that we require Canadian companies to respect standards that we expect of them here in Canada, even when they're operating. Um, I'm going to go straight to the back. The gentleman with the glasses here, yeah. Me? Yeah. Yes. Um, I would like to know why you support 
the uh, NDP support for the invasion of Libya, which resulted in the death of many uh, innocent civilians, women and children, and, in, and of course knowing that NATO employs the use of depleted uranium in their munitions, you must have realized this was a highly dangerous environmental move. So why do you support such conduct? The question is why did I support and why did the Congress support the invasion of, of Libya? You make the correct point when you mention that it was, well, you, you, failed, you mentioned NATO, but you don't mention the United Nations. I'll, I'll tell you quite honestly, I believe that our only hope in the world is to follow international law, follow international law. The United you Nations, law, hold on, you've asked radio. the question. If you want to ask the question and give the answers, just let me know, I'll give you the microphone. <laughs> but if you've asked the question, why don't you give me a chance to give the answer in that case. Um, Canada is still part of the United Nations. The United Nations Charter provides that one of the basic things that you're supposed to do as an international community is to protect citizens of a country from attacks, gratuitous attacks by the government. You're protecting citizens by bombing them? Well, let, let's look at the situation that, as it existed before, and let's look at what existed now. Inter international organizations have just completed their assessment of the elections that took place in Libya. We've replaced, because he was attacking his own citizens. It was stunning video posted on the internet for all to see, and it came with a charge that police masqueraded as protesters at this week's Montebello summit to incite violence. Tonight, an equally stunning admission from Quebec's provincial police. Susan Bonner reports. Busted. Three Quebec provincial police officers, identities masked, one carrying a huge rock, nabbed for infiltrating a peaceful protest at Montebello. The tip-off came from a union leader who noticed riot police standing by despite the obvious weapon. He accused the men of being undercover cops trying to provoke a riot and end the protest. The men were removed but never charged. After two days of questions, the Sûreté du Québec issued a news release late today confirming, yes, the men are police officers. Gaddafi, and we now have an election that international organizations all concur was extremely fair and a model for an election in a country that's never had any democratic process before. So frankly, between having a dictator there who was indeed subjugating and killing his own people, replacing him with a democratic system, I consider that to be progress, and you're free not to agree. They killed those. to uphold the International Monetary Fund to enforce currency on him when he was going to make a free, debt-free, interest-free currency? Honestly, I think there is to believe that the International Monetary Fund was behind the NATO attack in Libya is a theory that not too many people would agree with. Over here, please. Could you explain the legal stranglehold that China has on Canada if the Northern Pipeline does not go through, considering China, the government of China, have deposited billions and billions of dollars guaranteeing that such a thing will take place. I have no evidence that there's deposits by the government of China yeah, uh, guaranteeing uh, the, the construction of that pipeline. I do know that Mr. Harper is trying to use the threat of Northern Gateway as a bargaining chip to try to get Keystone XL, which I still think is his main play uh, to the United States. And it should be borne in mind that Keystone XL, according to an objective outside evaluation, it's not mine, would result in the export not only of raw bitumen, unprocessed, but it's also exporting tens of thousands of Canadian jobs to the Gulf Coast of Texas. Jobs of upgrading, refining, processing. So let's get into the habit, whether it's with regard to raw logs or raw bitumen, or our fisheries, because on the Atlantic coast, more and more of our fish are being taken, flash frozen, sent to China for processing. Let's make it a priority of an NDP government to tell Canadians that we will add value to our own resources here. Thomas Mulcair's NDP have some risky economic theories. Make them pay now for what they're doing. Their dangerous economic experiments include a carbon tax that'll raise the price of everything, including gas, groceries, and hydro. Mulcair's NDP even opposed trade agreements that'll increase exports. Risky theories, dangerous economic experiments. <laughs>
Okay, great, great question. Thank you. Dan, with a comment, uh, congratulating us for our position on the liberation as opposed to the invasion of Libya. When does a young couple that's starting off life with a $60,000 debt, when can they think of buying their house? And believe it or not, buying houses is a good thing for the economy. The only way to create wealth is to increase knowledge. Now this is an anti-knowledge government, they're anti-evidence, they don't like facts. You know, there's an old saw that came from an American politician named uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, that you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not allowed, you're not, you're not entitled to your own facts. So the conservatives actually believe they're entitled to their own facts. So, no young person who is capable of accomplishing their university studies should ever, in a country as rich as Canada, be denied that right for monetary consideration. Given that uh, several hundred people gathered on the Laws Parliament today to lament the death of evidence, I'm wondering if you can comment on federal funding for research in the public interest. Well, it dovetails nicely with the previous answer uh, about increasing knowledge as being really the only way to, to increase wealth. And if we can't get them on the principle of increasing knowledge, let's get them on the fact that it will increase wealth. How is it possible? to have a government that says that it doesn't believe in the science of climate change. If, if you have a government that says that there's no such thing as global warming, that it's a fairy tale being invented by um, environmental groups to, to raise money, or as Mr. Harper used to like to say, Kyoto was uh, an invention of, so, of socialists to suck money out of rich countries. Um, how, how do you deal with that rationally? And honestly, I think that the only way we're going to do it, it goes back to an earlier question, you know, why it takes so long? We need three years to define that. We need more marches on the hill. We'll have lots of Canadians starting to realize that we're dealing with something that's really quite foreign to us. We're dealing with a government that is using all the tools of the state, everything that's available to it, to pervert the essence of what a government is supposed to be about, providing the best public service in the public interest. Here, it's an ideologically driven government, and the danger there is, because they're convinced they're serving a higher purpose, they are also convinced that everybody's against them, and that therefore it's fair for them to cheat just a little bit. And they'll cheat on the facts, but more importantly, they'll cheat on the rules. And that's what we've seen time and again with regard to elections, because they believe that they're victims, and that they're serving a higher purpose, and therefore the normal rules don't apply. That's the number one danger that we're facing with. So you don't support the UN? No, it's very, very different things. I'm not saying I don't support the UN attempts. I'm not saying I don't support the UN attempts. I'm not saying I don't support the UN attempts. But what I'm saying is the only way to produce just an enforceable result is to have a What do you guys plan to do around disabilities or student loans as students uh, that are disabled, their debt is like double or triple the, the amount of uh, non disabled students? You know, Canada is a signatory to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Disabled, so I guess that's something that should be taken into account. Tom. Well, I'm, I'm just wondering uh, if the NDP is uh, really selling us something that we want, how would you feel about a rule by voluntary consent? I think it's rough. We always have to start from the yeah, position I'm that sorry. we're going to win sorry, the election we're... based on the current system. Again, again. That's why when we talk about, for example, proportional rep, which is something the NDP has stood for for a long time, we have to understand that it's something that can be put in our program, but we have to win under the current system. Okay, we, can't, so we can't wish it away, we can't change so it. If we think that the PC party is corrupt, for example, are you going to give us the option to withdraw from that system? I think that you have to understand that anything that you're going to be describing would be profound constitutional change, and we're in quite a very, we've got very serious constraints on how those changes can be made. Again, you have to deal in the real world, not in the theoretical. Okay.
okay, but it wouldn't require a huge change. You, all you'd have to do is change Section 2D of the Canadian Charter of Rights, which okay, defines the freedom of association. And uh, I think people should have the freedom. Well, if what you have to sell people is so good, then people should have the right to choose whether to have that or not. And that's what they get to do in elections. No, that's not a choice. That's every year. Who's my Yet we spend less than a couple of hundred million internally on uh, stopping the problem of homeless, drug abuse, addiction that afflicts so many Canadians and it makes us as a country look like we don't care about our own. I think we have to take a structured approach to dealing with poverty. It's actually something we've done in Quebec quite successfully. But all this money that we spend on foreign aid, helping all these foreign countries get up to our level, we can spend making our country so much more. I don't agree, I don't, I don't agree with that, that approach of saying that we should get the lowest common denominator. We do have an obligation to help them out because we are one of the rich It doesn't excuse us from allowing poverty to continue the way it does in the state, but you can do both. I don't think that we have to play with that. So how would you change poverty? How about a none of the above option on the ballots from now on? Thank you. Again. Why, why are I'm you, not going to answer it again. You've had the answer. Bombed no, 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 no. I totally agree with the leader. You, you agree answer. with the leader. Absolutely. So you agree with you can deplete uranium in Libya? And I agree with what my leader said. I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I agree with that. But it's, there's a big difference between decriminalization and police. So which would you be in favor of? start with decriminalization. I don't think that anybody should go to jail for simple possession. Thank you. Tom? Tom? Don't worry. Take good care. Thank you. I understand you're trying to get out of here, so I don't shake your hand. Don't ask anything. Okay, all the best. Have a good night. Have a time. I hope to see you in the next time. Okay, perfect. Hi. What do you think about the uh, invasion of Libya I'm and the sorry. bombing of people with uh, depleted uranium? Is that a good idea for uh, us to be doing? I ha you have no comment on that? Got a comment. Are you concerned about the women and children that were killed in Libya during that invasion? Uh, it, what about what about contaminating no, no, the area no, no. with depleted uranium? That's harassment. That is, a question. What that is harassment. Yeah. Guys, come on, have some class and verify your fucking sources, for Christ's sake. Conspiracy nuts? What are you, nuts? You goddamn crazy. Depleted uranium is Seriously. a conspiracy? Do you think that there's any any proof like that these people want to shoot depleted uranium at people? Oh, almost, they're almost certainly being used in Libya. If you examine some of the entrance wounds on some of the tanks, on some of the T-72s that I've seen, they're classic depleted uranium ammunition wounds, relatively small holes, and then exploded outward because when the, the, the DUA goes inside the tank, it explodes into a fireball about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is what produces all the dust and the, and the stuff that blows all over the place and gets on people's clothes and they breathe in, etc. But I thought this was supposed to be a humanitarian intervention, right? We're there to protect the people. I mean, what does it say about this country and, our, and the NATO allies if we're essentially going in to protect the Libyans but using something that is so devastatingly dangerous to, to human life? Well, it, it really should be banned. I mean, this uh, depleted uranium ammunition is really in the category of poison gas or dum dum bullets. The it's the kind of weapon that really should come under the Geneva Conventions because not only is it radioactive, that is, not only do you have, can you breathe it in and therefore it produces bone marrow changes and chromosomal changes and that kind of thing, uranium is extremely toxic metal. Uranium DUA rounds go very deep into the ground because they're so heavy. They there get into, according to the World Health Organization, they get into the water tables. And so people are drinking this stuff. No, there is, is not. Is it being used? Why are you accusing is it being people? Used? Is it being used? Prove it. 
I would like you to prove it. You got a name and number? I'll give you all. I'll, I'll, I'll eat. Not with conspiracy crap. I want a piece of the depleted uranium there are people, found there on. There are people that yeah. went and yeah. cleaned up in Desert Storm. Yeah, who that's are, who Desert Storm. Hair that's Desert Storm. That that's on Bush. Uranium. That's on Bush. That was depleted uranium. That's how it was done. The same you guys got to take your bloody tinfoil hats off. That's All your shit is... these war crimes of tinfoil hats. Mike, yeah. you're stolen. supporting the Republicans, buddy. Yeah, you're a loser, buddy. Ron Paul, 2012. Yeah. Republican. The same people told you climate change, didn't they? Did you get that on camera, too? Or not? My name's Josh. I was just hoping uh, I could ask you a few questions about sustainable development. Sure. Um, have you heard of uh, the United Nations Agenda 21? Yes. Are you in favor of it or like, do you not find that it undermines our national and somewhat provincial sovereignty for the international agreements on like this Agenda 21? I've got a few books on it written by Rosa Cor um, about how it's an anti-human agenda and how this that sustainable development is used to like cram us all into cities to eliminate our rural populations not like eliminate as in kill but like push everybody out of living on farms um, having property rights as to cramming us all into cities to maximize things like um, urban growth um, light urban transit, getting us out of our um, private vehicle ownership, out of our private property. Right. Um, does well, that all you, sound when good? You're, when you're about to track 9 billion people and in a province like British Columbia where 85% of British Columbia is now live in urban populations, we're not only talking about the trajectory of, of development in the world, but we're also talking about how to use resources uh, most wisely and to sustain the population that we, that we now have in the world. So you need to be thinking about that. You cannot yeah. have an unplanned... But uh, don't the people that live in the areas, the ones that are using those resources, wouldn't they be the best stewards versus people that are sure. unelected well, why and would, don't why live? Why would this United Nations agenda threaten the agricultural land reserve, the, the land management planning process that we have in British Columbia, any of those types of things that we're doing, any of our stewardship programs that we have here in British Columbia, our rights to hunt and fish, doesn't threaten anyone. A lot of it does, though. The, wow. U the UN Agenda 21 specifically states that dams Next are going to tell me that they're a world government, well, right? No, I'm not talking about that. Oh. I'm talking about the Agenda 21. There's an actual part of it that talks about unsustainable construction, like dams. And BC, most of our electricity comes from dams, dams, hydroelectric dams, right? And so if we move towards a full implementation of Agenda 21, our dams well, get labeled this. as unsustainable. I'll and tell you this, there will be a, a new dam reservoir on the Peace River that will come up for discussion. BC, of course, has a two rivers policy and has since the 1950s, 1960s. That's not going to change, whatever the United Nations says or doesn't say. Uh, but the site seat time will be very interesting because there will, it will come down to an environmental review that it will consider the greenhouse gases that are emitted when you flood uh, that much uh, agricultural land uh, and uh, put that many kilometers worth of the valley underwater. There's going to be an environmental impact, there's no question about it. So, and that'll be weighed against uh, the type of uh, hydroelectricity that you can produce versus other types of fossil fuels. So, but don't, those decisions should be made by the people of BC, not the people well, of the United will be. Nations. Right? They'll be made by the Environmental Assessment Office of British Columbia, the cabinet of British Columbia, whoever the government of the day is, and all the Canadian and British Columbian regulatory agencies. So if the, U, the NDP get in, they won't implement Agenda 21, or well, it, they will look to that to, for guidance? Um, there is no jurisdiction that supplants Canadian or provincial rights to make those decisions. Well, the UN tries. Well, I, 
I, I don't think so. I think like it's one of those well-intentioned uh, guidelines, and there are some very strong points of discussion that are relevant to British Columbia. I mean, you know, the UN brings some of the smartest people together in the world and talks about shared problems that we have. We can't be insular and parochial about where we live and how we live. We all have a uh, common interest, for example, in the atmosphere. Carbon, uh, carbon dioxide emissions uh, don't respect uh, borders and, and air sheds where they're emitted. Uh, we, we live in the same fine right? So, yeah. there you go. All right, Good to talk to you, mate. Mm -hmm. Take care. Okay, so we uh, confronted Mr. Thomas Mulcair uh, making blatant statements to the fact that he agrees with NATO uh, and the alliance bombing Libyan civilians with uh, depleted uranium. Uh, doesn't seem to have a problem with it, didn't take exception to it, didn't do anything to uh, suggest that it was uh, less than benign to uh, follow the UN mandates to invade foreign countries, even though NATO is the North uh, Atlantic uh, alliance and has nothing to do with Africa, he seems to think it's fine for people to bomb Africa um, for some reason. And uh, clearly he does not believe that it had anything to do with Mr. Gaddafi actually uh, creating a currency that would be uh, interest free for his uh, people, but and <laughs> it had nothing to do with the International Monetary Fund uh, issues. It was about him killing his own citizenry which um, we know is a ruse. We know the reason why they really went in there. And uh, we have them on record saying so. All right, so I attended today's uh, uh, gathering with Mr. Uh, uh, Thomas. I don't care, I'm stealing your money anyways. Um, and uh, that's exactly what he said he was going to do. Um, he presented his platform, which involved a lot of green tyranny, and uh, uh, evaded the questions regarding Agenda 21. Josh asked him about Agenda 21, and the guy completely supported it, but shirked away from saying that uh, he fully supported it, in that he thinks it's only a start. So that's just the start of the tyranny that you're going to get to experience under his rule. And uh, uh, I specifically asked about rule by voluntary consent. I, I asked Mr. Mulcair if uh, what he was selling Canadians was so good that he would be willing to put his money where his mouth is and let people withdraw if they find out later on that it's a tyranny, just like, well, what we supposedly did with the PC party since he was spending the whole time cutting them up. Now, uh, Mr. Mulcair said uh, it, that uh, he can do something later, but then also said that he would uh, 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 give us the opportunity to deal with it four years later once when he gets into power. So this is the kind of system that he wants us locked into. He wants to peddle more or less the same. And uh, uh, I also noticed today a uh, deep entrenchment of uh, international socialists and communists attending this rally. And uh, uh, I never did get the opportunity to ask Mr. Mulcair about the fact that his party is infiltrated by people who totally express Trotskyist views. And for, for those who don't understand what a Trotsky view is, it's a form of communism that requires um, a uh, violent uprising in order to bring about the change. So um, um, there's lots of issues here today on the table. The guy totally comes across as a tyrannical, micromanaging control freak. He says he's going to tax the rich, but I bet you any money that the rich are just going to pay themselves the same amount of money and charge us more. He doesn't explain that uh, in order to enforce such a system of taxation upon the rich, that he'd have to implement some sort of price capping on end-of-the-line consumer products. Um, but they'll never, they'll never add that. Um, furthermore, uh, I noticed uh, a lot of the politicians scurrying away when they started to get asked the tough questions. Uh, Randall Garrison practically ran away from us when we were uh, getting the camera set up. And uh, Mr. Mulcair uh, took off after he noticed there was too many questions that weren't working to his favor coming from one side of the crowd. So we are Change Victoria doing what we do best. We came to a federal NDP event for the leader of the NDP, Thomas Mulcair. Uh, we've been here in the belly of the beast, UVic. I'm standing right in front of their propaganda sustainability wall. Um, I'm sure if we look at some of these we'll find 
um, people trying to secretly implement Agenda 21 programs. We confronted Mulcair on a few things like Agenda 21, the bombing campaign in Libya, although we kept trying to switch it and say that it wasn't a bombing campaign, it was a liberation campaign. We freed the shit out of those Libyans, you know. Now they're going on about their fake election. He full out called uh, some of the info that we had false, that the rebels were not CIA plants, and he said that the Gaddafi regime was actually attacking its own citizens, which was the pretext to go to war, which upon later information they found out that that actually wasn't true, and they were, I believe it was Russian planes that were firing. It wasn't Gaddafi. Anyways, you know, we confronted him on Agenda 21. We confronted a lot of these politicians on Agenda 21. This whole sustainable development, sustainable environment, sustainable economy. When you hear these politicians talk about sustainable anything, they are literally talking about Agenda 21. You need to go and ask them if they're planning on implementing Agenda 21. I encourage you to read Agenda 21. There is a specific part in the Agenda 21 that declares what is unsustainable development. And included in that is hydroelectric dams. Well, BC, we use hydroelectric dams for most of our electricity. To have the UN Agenda 21 come in and tell us that we now cannot have dams because they're unsustainable, where are we going to get our electricity from?